All right. Hi, everyone. Good to see everyone today. So um, today the topic is going to be, is green postmodern actually a stage of development? And I know that almost everyone has commented on this uh, you know, idea. I, I know that Charles explicitly questioned it and Heidi said some interesting things about noticing how some people can be, develop green first and then have developed the orange, which is, you know, ostensibly a lower level later on. So it's, it seems to be some questions or doubt about the whole subject. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to try to discuss that. <clears throat> um, few things I want to go over today. So we're, well, again, we'll do um, one minute intros and two minute uh, shares. And of course, uh, again, I highly encourage people to ask follow up questions or try to probe people into going a little deeper if, if they want clarification or if they find what you're saying interesting, the follow-up questions will allow you to talk longer. And I'll give a 30 second warning as I always do, but instead of this time, instead of just uh, interrupting someone, I will play this to let you know that your time is up. And we'll drown out your voice with some peaceful Native American flute music. Um, I, I normally would use a bell, but I don't have a bell, so that will do for today. And the last thing I want to say before we get started is um, Heidi and I were talking about using breakout rooms on Zoom. And so the idea with a breakout room is that if there is a discussion or seems to be um, a particular issue that maybe let's say only two people want to iron out, but it may be slightly deviant from the, the main subject or may not be of complete interest to other people, but you still feel like it's important to discuss. We can have two people or three people go into a breakout room and discuss it and then return to the main group and just briefly share the, the summary of their disagreement or confusion or whatever. So we don't use up group time. So this will make it more focused um, and hopefully be more efficient. And in real life, uh, I do this a lot with groups. So hopefully we can try it on Zoom. So just a little bit about that. If something comes up and I, I'll, and I feel like it may be appropriate to use a breakout room, I'll just suggest it. Hey, you know, Karen and Charles, do you want to try a breakout room? Come back in 10 minutes. Um, or you can just let me know. You can text me and say, can, can I do a breakout room with Charles or, you know, or just talk to me and, and you, we can do that. If you do go into a breakout room, there's a little, button at, on your lower right that should say return to main group or, or leave breakout room. So whenever you're ready, just hit that thing and come back. So you won't be drifting out in the ether forever. Um, and I'll, I'll check up on you if, uh, if it does seem like it, it's taking a while. So, is it, so hopefully that's, uh, that's clear. So let's just um, begin with uh, the one minute intro. And for this one minute intro, if everyone could just say, what their position is on the subject. Do you believe green is a stage? Do you have some doubts about it? Do you have any questions about it? So just say um, your position on the subject. And also, um, I want to throw in something a little fun in there too, so we can kind of get to know each other personally. So after that, I just want everyone to share today, what is your favorite snack? So I'll go first. So um, I'm Ryan and I do think green is a stage of development, but I do have some doubts and I understand people's doubts. So I'm excited to dive into that today. And my favorite snack is uh, organic peanut butter cup. I am more or less with the, I'm Heidi, uh, more or less uh, your idea. Pe peanut butter I got to know too, and it's, n it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite snack is very dark chocolate. And um, I also wanted to say that we have a new person here, Key T.S. Coaching, and I would uh, love to hear who he is. And so also in, include the personal presentation uh, or the personal you know, information. I'm Heidi in Italy, and I'm doing normally leading the Sunday calls while Ryan is uh, um, leading the Thursday calls, so, so far me. Well, going in clockwise order here, I guess I can go next. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Favorite snack? Uh, Nutella, right out of the jar. I'm Charles. I'm speaking from uh, British Columbia in Canada. And uh, what have I been thinking about lately? Yeah, what's, what's your position on the, is green a stage of development? You know, I haven't entirely made up my mind, but um, I have some reasons which, which I'd like to talk about for thinking that, that green is not a stage. So I'm, I'm glad you've introduced this topic, and uh, I think it should be fun. Um, and just to uh, uh, suggest a way of getting into this, and I know we're not starting it, we'll probably want to describe what we mean by the green level in general, and then talk about healthy and unhealthy. So these, these are things I've been thinking about over the last hour. So as you can imagine, I'm super prepared for this. And that's it for me for now. I'll go next. I'm Karen in Berkeley, California. My favorite snack right now is kind bars, but only the ones with lots and lots of nuts and dark chocolate. So there seems to be a chocolate theme going here. Um, the, I'm, a, I'm a historian by training and for a presentation, I actually prepared a chart of all the levels. So I'm prepared to argue that I think green is a separate level, but I am very curious to hear what people say who see it differently. Um, I think that's enough for now. Um, right. I'll go ahead, Purple. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to jump on the chocolate bandwagon. I was just thinking that if they added more dark chocolate to Nutella, maybe with some like cocoa nibs uh, thrown in there, like that would just be, I don't know, another level for me. Um, and I, I don't feel remotely prepared for green in this part. I think it's really interesting because I think the whole how do levels orient, orient and how do they grow uh, is kind of confusing. Um, at the same time, I think my stance is like quite off the cuff, just like, yeah, coarse greens is coarse green is a level. Um, is kind of my stance. Um, and kind of looking forward to the debate actually, because I think there's definitely some uh, interesting areas of ambiguity and all this kind of stuff. So that's me. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, my name is Ari. I'm calling from Edmonton, Canada, and uh, I'm originally from Iraq, and I have been following Ken's work for almost over a year. I'm new to the program. This is my first time, and happy to be here with every one of you. And uh, about the subject, uh, I'm not sure because uh, uh, I will see what what uh, develop or what evolve during the program. Uh, and my favorite snack, I don't have one. Thank you. I, I just want to say welcome and welcome to the group. It's great to, great to see a new face. Can you tell me your name again? Ari, A-R-I. Great, thank you, Ari. And I'm from Iraq. I'm starting a coaching school in Iraq. Awesome. Shall I, do you know how to rename you so that we have your name uh, here visible, or shall I do that? Sure, please do that, A-R-I, yeah. Okay. Thank good. you. Okay, my turn. Hello, everyone. Uh, Theo here. Um, so for me, my favorite snack, uh, I don't know, I like to drink tea, <laughs> so I'll say that. Um, about the subject, I, I'm a bit, uh, I, I th yeah, I think it exists. Um, what I've been thinking about a lot is how we tend to describe the stage is, is really important depending on how what we're talking about or what we're trying to get at into our, our, our thinking or uh, our discussions. Sometimes you'll see qualities of what we, we, we tend to call a certain stage of view or worldview into other uh, worldviews and that's just the way it goes because we evolve. Um, so it can become a bit messy to say, hey, this is, you know, uh, that stage being represented. So we have to be careful, I think, of that. Um, because one other aspect is 
stage of development are for individuals are also related to their ability to take many perspective, like to take different, more perspective than their own. Uh, so first person, second person, third person, fourth person, fifth person. Um, and we don't really know what sixth person is yet because it, it hasn't come online. So yeah, just my, my, uh, my few pointers towards that. I think it does exist, but uh, it's not as uh, simple as we'd like it to be maybe sometime. <laughs> Great, thank you, Theo. Okay, I think that was everyone. Charles, you're raising your hand. Uh, uh, per, uh, asking permission to record, Ryan. Would that be okay? I'd like to record this. Uh, this. Uh, uh, I think. I think that Heidi, do you have a? I just allowed you recording. You should be able to do it. Oh, great. Thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There we go. All right. Who, want, who wants to begin and, and uh, make their case for why it is or is not a, a stage? And again, we're doing two minutes, and I'll give you a 30-second warning. Go ahead, Charles. Um, I think I should start with a brief description of what the green level is, is supposed to be, what, it, what its general characteristics are. So, um, and I don't think this will take more than a minute. I'm just gonna read uh, this short description that appears in Integral Life Practice as a starting point. Might be other things we'll wanna add. All right, so here, the green worldview can stand outside the monolithic systems of orange and see multiple points of view. Since green cannot yet make judgments of depth, pluralism and egalitarianism become the most appropriate responses. Everything is equally interconnected in the holistic web of life. Green moves to demarginalize alternative minority, and underrepresented voices. The pluralistic worldview attempts to give equal recognition to a diversity of perspectives. Green first made itself known on the world stage in the 1960s. Indeed, all the major social revolutions of that time have green footprints from the environmental movement to the holistic health movement to the human potential movement. Green's strong sense of pluralistic sensitivity drives it to scan the horizon to make sure that nobody's feelings get hurt and nobody gets left out. Political correctness, an emphasis on community, and consensus decision-making, uh, decision-making processes often result. Okay, that's, that's the description. So Charles, maybe you can take another minute. Just, just um, tell us, what are some of your personal doubts about green being a stage? Okay. Very briefly, I've, I've had these doubts for a while because every time I think about green and read about it, it seems to me inherently unstable. Um, for example, compare it with orange. Orange is a, a, a really stable uh, level of development, uh, partly because it has uh, a clearly identifiable and, and vastly researched epistemology, namely the scientific method, which is also very successful and has produced a uh, uh, continuous stream of advanced technologies that people find very useful uh, and enjoyable for their lives. So it's, uh, it's got a lot going for it. Um, you know, the, the propaganda that supports the orange level is, is uh, powerful. Uh, Compare green with that. If, if you ask yourself, well, what is, what is green's epistemology? What is main epistemology? Uh, there might be a four quadrant answer to that, but uh, it seems to me that the principal one that it relies upon is deconstruction or a more technical term. Uh, uh, well, criticism, as I was gonna say uh, the opposite, but it's uh, uh, in general criticism and technically uh, deconstruction. 
So uh, Green's orientation toward the world is kind of negative. Uh, it's what's wrong with all the other levels. And uh, deconstruction doesn't seem to me uh, to be a complete epistemology. So that's, that's part of my case. If, if it doesn't have a, com uh, uh, a convincing epistemology, then it's going to have a hard time uh, competing with people on the rational level. Great. Thanks, Charles. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah. Excellent points, Charles, as always. Let me take the opposite side on this. Um, I, I, I would back off a little bit from the deconstruction and say the core value or orientation of green is existentialism. I think I see deconstructionism as kind of the extreme veering into pathological. Um, a year ago, I drew up this chart. <laughs> there it is. Uh, for a presentation on the levels uh, to my church group. These, most of them had never heard of Ken Wilber, so I didn't get into all of the jargon. But this is, these are the levels starting from um, Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Ancient High Empires, Modernity, Postmodern, which I parse as an entirely separate year. It's the sixth. And part of the reason for this instability, which I agree with you, Charles, is because it is the final stage of the first tier and those of us who are pushing on are getting ready to go into a completely new tier. I mean, this is the first time in human history there has ever been a change of tier. We've had six changes of level and I tracked them. The uh, vertical purple lines here are the transitions between the leading edge eras and those tend to be times of great turmoil. We're in one now, we're in the seventh. Um, I tracked the um, kind of, uh, I in all of the eight areas of human endeavor, um, technology, energy, communication, transportation, economy, social, political, cultural, cognitive frameworks, core values, and religion, there is a completely discernibly different form at green as there is for all the previous levels. And this is my basis for saying, oh, yes, green is a separate level. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hearing your point, Charles, that there is a disintegrative factor and an uncertainty here. Um, and now I'm, I'm asking myself, did we have that in different ways in the previous levels, or is this something new at Green? So I'll stop there for now. Aaron, can you say, uh, just to clarify, you had mentioned Green associated with existentialism, or exist can you say a little bit more about that? Sartre Camus, whom I don't know very well, but um, as we back off from the scientific era, I mean, with uh, the, the atom bomb, suddenly we're no longer certain that science is going, and reason is going to give us the answer for everything. There's a great malaise that comes in in the mid-century. And the existential answer is there is no God. This is horrific. I mean, there's, I, I could go into a lot of detail. There's this vast horror around the mid-century as this new green is coming in. And the existential philosophy says there is, well, there's no God, there's no meaning. There is no meaning out there in the universe. The only meaning there is, is what we as human beings bring to it. So this is a noble tragic, we are condemned to freedom, but we are the ones who bring meaning and people do it in different ways. But I see that as correlating a lot of the cultural expressions at Green. There is a very specific culture, kind of cultural expression of Green, T.S. Eliot, um, waiting for Godot who never comes. Um, there are a lot of cultural things that cluster around this. So I would say that's why I say existential, I posit existentialism as the core value. Go ahead, Heidi. I also want to uh, say something to that, Charles, what you are naming, the deconstruction and the criticism, that seems to me right-hand quadrant uh, practices. While in green, we have the development of left-hand, uh, left-side quadrant uh, practices, uh, which come out, which have never come out there before, like spirituality in this more research uh, way, not God uh, in the cloud, but uh, finding uh, a way to, to, to meaning by and to the unification with uh, uh, some higher principle, let's say, and the psychotherapy thing, you know, that uh, uh, hasn't been there before. And 
that for me is one of the main, 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 main uh, uh, aspects of, of, of the green, let's say level, yeah, maybe it's a level, probably. My criticism with level, or my idea that it might not be a level in the sense that it is not necessarily the sequence that it comes after orange because some people develop maybe by education or by culture, group culture, the, the sensibility of green before they come into rational planning uh, and, 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 you know, technological ideas. So, but I do think that it is something completely new. And I agree with you, Karen, uh, that I that deconstructionism might be the pathological form of of uh, the research. So that's what I wanted to say. Now, uh, maybe adding that in some way, green is also uh, going back from separation and uh, analysis and an analysis into bringing into synthesis and bringing things together in some way again, even if it is still very scattered, you know. But... Um, I was thinking about the the constructivist angle um, or, or deconstruction, because I definitely think of, when I think of my least palatable parts of green it's definitely the deconstructing but my mind did go to it definitely went to therapy and the interior like to me that that's probably one of the strongest ways that I think of a um like a quantum leap from orange like whenever I've seen oranges and greens interact like the amount of emotional empathy sort of difference um hmm, sorry getting it well g generally that that seems to be the case um, but I was thinking, for example, a constructive thing. I think there are there. It's not just a deconstruction. I think of orange, although I think there there is a lot that it has to do because of that. You know, like racism and, and gender and all these various uh, inequalities and things like this. But I think there are there are constructive elements of it. I think of the '60s and the explosion of music and art and all this kind of stuff. Or um, one of the strongest ways for me is, for example, is health, like. I think in green, there's a very strong emphasis on sort of almost like innate goodness, um, like the, the innate goodness of nature, or the innate goodness of the, the human body to be able to, to heal itself. I think that also relates a little bit to the therapeutic world of the sort of the, the innate goodness of the inner child or the sort of preciousness of um, human life. So... I can I can kind of see this like deconstructing and construction and to sort of be honest to myself like I feel a little bit schizophrenic in the the ways I think about green um, almost to the point of I think of the construction of I don't know maybe in the 60s or maybe some of the different areas and then when I think of the real pain in the ass of green it definitely has this um, deconstruction so I think it's I, I I'm not sure if that's the the good and the bad of green, because I think some of green's deconstruction is valid, but I think there is, there's a little bit of that for me. Like these days, if I was going to think of the bad of green, it would definitely be on the, the deconstructing, deconstruction side of it, where it gets to the point of like, I don't know, almost deconstructing everything for the sake of it, like the good, the true, the beautiful and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that'll do. Karen, did you have your hand raised before and then Charles? Oh, well, first I have to say, yeah, Paul, we had the best music. <laughs> um, green to me is the stage where, yes, everything you said, Paul, um, there's a real yearning, a, a in, intuition of and yearning for the innate goodness, for the help, for the healing, for the bringing back in all the peoples who've been marginalized and oppressed. And that's one of the great shining glories of green. At the same time, as I understand green, it's where as we wake up in green or grow up into green, we, be, we are at our most alienated, lonely, aware of how fragmented, how separate we are from each other. And there's a yearning for a coming together. But I think that coming together really starts to take hold as we go up into second tier. To me, green is the most aware of, the fra of fragmentation. 
and, and unable to bring it together. And we've talked in past, I think some of, we've talked in some of these past forums about pinko politics, where you have the best intentions, but you go around and around and never resolve anything because everybody ha has an equal voice and you don't have any way to value one idea over another. So to me, um, in some ways, green is the most beautiful and the most alienated at the same time, but it's that longing that propels us then into second tier. Charles. Uh, the, these comments about the positive aspects of green are great because uh, we need to balance things off here um, in order to give due respect to, to green, whatever it is, whether it's a stage of development. Um, and, and by the way, I do think it's a kind of stage of development, but the alternative interpretation that caught my ear a while back was uh, from, I believe, the de developmentalist Jenny Wade, who thinks that uh, there were two ways of coming out of amber, and they diverge. Uh, one of them is green, and the other is integral. So if you can imagine the, the color spectrum, and then these two branches shooting off from amber, uh, you'll get a visualization of, uh, of this idea. Okay, so if... Um, uh, all right, so we'll set that aside for the moment, but I want to talk about deconstruction for just a second. Um, its method uh, originated in uh, departments of literature, I understand, and it is, uh, it is a method of seeking out hidden, uh, the hidden text in any given work, um, uh, sometimes with a view of exposing uh, biases uh, and uh, especially uh, themes that have to do with power. Um, now, as, as a method, I think deconstruction is, is perfectly valid, and, um, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. Um, in, in The Marriage of Sense and Soul, uh, Ken Wilber talks about the benefits of postmodern philosophy, and I'm going to desperately see if I can find the right passage here. Uh, when he's, about he's 10 talking, seconds, Charles. 10 seconds, all right. The, uh, he identifies three aspects of postmodern philosophy that are real contributions. One of, those, one of them is contextualism, the idea that, uh, uh, that every notion, every claim we make uh, has a context, and that exists within larger context, and that within larger context, and that uh, this is a positive contribution to epistemology, and we should take uh, context into consideration all the time. Uh, the second, the, the, another one is a perspectivism. That is, you can't sort of uh, dogmatically claim that one perspective uh, is is the best and dominates all the others. Uh, and there's a third one. So uh, if I find the exact quotation, I'll bring it up a little later. So let me finish off by saying that I don't think deconstruction was 100% a bad thing. That uh, it uh, undoubtedly has made uh, an important contribution to critical theory. Karen, did you? Uh... Yes, I had a question for Charles about Jenny Wade. Um, are, you, are you with me, Charles, or are you busy with Ken Wilber? No, sure, yeah. go ahead. Um, when Jenny Wade saw the, the split, the fork in the road, um, did she see green as a dead end, or did green also progress onto something else? Do you know? Uh, I haven't read Jenny Wade. I just, I'm, I know about this. Uh, from Ken Wilber himself. Uh, Ken Wilber says, uh, you know, Jen, uh, Jenny Wade has a different interpretation of green uh, than I do. And uh, if I remember correctly, he says, in the end, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. And I think that's true. Um, so a, a person at, uh, at green, regardless of which interpretation you're using, uh, has to go somewhere. And its options are, to go down into tribalism, radical subjectivism, uh, uh, political correctness, and eventually nihilism, uh, as uh, uh, many of Wilbur's works talk about at length and, and as the community as a whole has talked about. Or, or an individual at Green uh, becomes uh, somehow 
uh, deeply distressed about the instability of his or her position and uh, somehow gets wind of integral and transcends and includes and achieves liberation in that matter. So yes, there is a way out of unhealthy green. <laughs> Theo or Ari, did you have any uh, comments about anything? Uh, yeah, me, okay, so I, I'm trying to sort out my thinking about this uh, to make sense. Uh, one thing I've been observing is that if I look into just like how the different stage evolved to someone's life, I see that, you know, um, someone at 12 years old, 16 years old could have a lot of green already into their perspective. And that is interesting because it gives us a clue as to, uh, are, are they touching those values or are they really able to enact this complexity of thinking at that at that age and that's that's two question there um are and 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 then in a way does that mean that the stage are progressing faster now because we have to no matter like a child is born and then they, they face reality and it's just like so complex they have to adapt so quickly much quicker something like that so that's one of my thinking going on and and you know like fourth person perspective green is this ability to take the perspective of the planet as well, sort of, or the caring for others and so on in, in different form. Uh, and, and it's, we, we say that it's only able to do that. It's not able to take the other perspective as well, like third and second as, as, as integral uh, is able to, to, to make an analysis, to make a synthesis and an understanding of uh, any kind of problem, but often more complex problem. So that's my point. It's a, there's no definite answer in there, but that I think those are important aspects to look at. Go ahead, Heidi. I wanted to take on this, um, this uh, observation that green language or green ideas are used, and that doesn't mean that the people are on that stage, you know? That's often used, and for me, for instance, small children use the, this language which they learn from their parents. And that is sort of a conform, conformity with their parents that they, uh, that they say things what their parents say. But it's not that they are further ahead in their development. They just talk, talk like their parents do. They imitate their parents. Only the content of the words seem to be from a different level. But that doesn't mean that they are in a different level. And that is also um, true for societies, you know, but... Uh, use certain languages and uh, maybe to even make other people feel guilty when they say you don't uh, use your own, you don't follow your own rules and <laughs> you, you are incongruent. But that doesn't mean that they are on this level which they use the language of. Go ahead, Karen. Yes, Theo, I'd like to bring in Piaget's developmental levels here because I think that may be part of, of how I, well, that's part of how I would address this. In this chart that I drew up, I have two axes, two um, vertical axes. There's Piaget's cognitive levels up one side and the levels of history, human history on the other, and they match precisely across. And this was one of Wilbur's great genius uh, breakthroughs way early in uh, Up From Eden, I think, where he equated Piaget's developmental levels with the stages of human society and cultures. And, it, it, and as a cultural historian, I can say they match astonishingly. Something profound is at work here. Going to Piaget's developmental levels, these, I think, are hardwired in us as I understand them. I mean, a, a three-year-old is not going to be able to understand algebra no matter how high an IQ that three-year-old has. There's a certain level of abstract thinking, a next level of abstract thinking that comes in with the, the, the brain wiring as we go from age three <clears throat> to age seven, to age 11, to age 18, and even 26. Further levels of abstract thinking and great insight come with that developmental, that, and that development is hardwired in us. And, you, and, that's, and that to me is why the levels of human culture go up the way they do as more people, as a plurality of people become um, 
grow up to that level too. So some of this developmentalism, and yes, exactly what Heidi said. I mean, a child who grows up in a green environment is going to have this cognitive, this, this kind of moral values in there, they're going to breathe it, but they don't really fully come online with them as an individual until they reach that level. And it's, they are capable of internalizing it at that level. I mean, that, that was kind of a mess at the end, but I'll stop there anyway. Go ahead, Charles. Okay, I found that quotation from Wilbur. So uh, just quickly, uh, in this book, uh, The Marriage of Sense and Soul, he's, he's trying to show how science and religion can be reconciled. And in this section about uh, the contribution of postmodernism, he identifies the following. Constructivism, contextualism, and integral a perspectivism. So it boils them all, all down into these three isms, which he takes to be contributions of the green level, which need to be preserved, uh, uh, taken up into integral, uh, uh, transcending the bad aspects of green, of course, but including the positive, and these are among the positive. So constructivism is the view that reality is not 100% uh, pre-given but it's partly constructed by our uh, consciousness, especially working in conjunction with others. So we can talk about social constructivism of ideas. Uh, and a lot of people think that's, uh, that's a valid uh, uh, contribution, and I do too. Contextualism, I've already mentioned on that, that uh, meaning is context dependent. And uh, postmodernism says all the contexts are are boundless, that is theoretically infinite, okay, and we should keep this in mind. And thirdly, uh, integral a perspectivism means uh, that there's no a priori um, bias um, or privilege in favor of any single perspective. Now, all of those points have both healthy and unhealthy applications, but uh, Wilbur and lots of others and, and myself regard the healthy versions as a real contribution to modern epistemology. Okay, should, should I stop there? That's just by way of kind of shoring up that previous thing that I said. Karen, you're, it looks like you're very excited to say something. Ooh, 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 yes, thank you, Charles. The constructivism, yes, to me, that is one of the points that nails it for me, that green is a separate stage, because up to orange, we have all fallen for what can they call the myth, the myth of the given, that we just assume all the way through orange, that the reality out there is out there, and we are simply perceiving it as it is with green. And that's just part of why we have this feeling of disintegration at green, because we just start to get it that it's all a construct. It's all our mental construct. You know, anything we know is just a map and the map is not the territory. We start to get it and everything starts dissolving. And that's part of the alienation and the sense of confusion and thing, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. That's part of the existential angst that is a touchstone of green to me as a cultural historian. Now, as we go up into second tier and third tier, we start to see that more and more and more is a construct and we start to get comfortable with it. But there is this profound distress, the, the, the fear and loathing unto death, you know, Kierkegaard and so on, that is an element of green. And thank you, Charles, because that you just, you just kind of nailed that for me. The, the myth of the given, we start to see through that at green. It's like, oh my God, where do we go from here? Well, from there, the only place to go is either the great regression, as who was it, Theo said, or we push off into second tier. I was thinking with that, and I kind of like the, the good and bad of green being, being dissected. Like to me, the, the bad of green is basically when um, you just go completely into the left quadrants. And you basically say that the the right, anything objective doesn't exist. So it's kind of narcissism 
uh, solipsism and nihilism where it's kind of that saying basically that everything is constructed. Um, so all meaning is just completely arbitrary. Basically just everything is um, completely arbitrary as opposed to this kind of incredible subjective world that has its own uh, rules and um, I guess laws and, and causes of effect and all this kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if this is like overly simplistic, but part of me sees the jump to integral, like many stages actually, it's basically just including the stage before. So green having to admit that actually orange has some pretty rock solid stuff to say, that actually the objective world out there does have a lot to inform your, um, your subjectivity. So instead of the subjective world being this, this nihilistic place full of like terrible art and like terrible moral judgments that actually it's kind of this, um, I don't know, very, very potent, very potent place that's actually better done in, in combination um, uh, with the world outside and stuff. Theo, did you, why? yeah, go ahead, Theo. Yeah, that's all really interesting. For me now, it's, it's also, what do you think happens uh, if we all agree or to some extent that green does exist as a level of development and it's, it's different uh, manifestation, um, different ability to take perspective and it's more this, the constructive side or more constructive and also more uh, uh, empathetic abilities. Um, what, where is the shift happen, you know, from, from, uh, from green to integral? what pushes the boundaries of, of, of green to kind of be like, oh my God, like this is, this is not working anymore. Like I'm confused. Like I can't, I can't, I can't live with this perspective anymore. What do you think is, is the, the breaking point or the, um, uh, so then we can say, okay, that's when green is, 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 is changing and letting go of, of, uh, uh, of certain characteristics that are not helpful anymore. That's a, that's a, um, that's a great question, Theo. <clears throat> I'll, just, I'll just say here really quickly that I think what, we're, what we've been doing in this discussion, which has been really helpful, is teasing apart also what are the deeper structures of green. And these deeper structures are kind of indicative of the true level of green development versus the surface content that anyone can inherit from their culture or parents or whatever. So a 10-year-old can be talking a good green game and, and be ostensibly for what all the things green is for but it, their internal development may not have that postmodern complexity, you know, and I'm thinking about how Ken was talking about the Vietnam war protesters, how they were in the sixties and they looked like they're very green externally, but when they were actually interviewed, it, their level of development was actually like at red. So they were, he calls it like masquerading, like a lower stage masquerading behind a noble social cause, you know, and I think teasing that out has been really helpful. And just to add to Theo's question, another thing I'll throw into the group too, and which may be helpful, be a helpful way to focus this discussion is, if green really is a stage of development, or let's, let, let's say green is not a stage of development, then you could take a quantum leap from orange into integral. So, so there was even someone on the forum that's, that had a post called skipping green on the way to second tier. So if green is a stage, that means that you couldn't take a quantum leap from orange into integral. So I'm just interested to hear people's thoughts. Go ahead, Karen. I imagine you could go fairly quickly through any individual stage so fast as to seem like you were skipping. We're never entirely in one stage at any time. We're always kind of spread out over a number with the plurality of our, you know, our center of gravity in one stage. So it's complicated on there. But to get to Theo's point, and this is changing the slant here, um, for every stage up, um, green, what we're calling by Ken's colors, we've got technologies, we've got communication transmission method, transportation methodologies, we've got separate kinds of economies, separate societies. One of the things that is associated with every step up culturally is a new technology and specifically a new communication technology. And like for instance, the invention of writing was part of the whole shift from um, into the ancient and high empires, the invention of writing, right? Now we've had a very big shift 
into green and from green. In green, now we've got, suddenly we've got smartphones, we've got the internet. That's huge. That is huge. That is part of what's propelling the second tier, I think. I mean, I take very seriously the, the concept that we human beings are now Gaia's brain. We, each of us are a gray cell in Gaia's brain and we are establishing synaptic connections with each other like this Zoom chat, you know? We, we, we are a plexus now. I mean, we are becoming uh, guys in our third trimester. And so with this new technology is very specific to green. Can I just, um, just because it was straight on the back of that, I was just thinking it was interesting the way that it seems like different quadrants and lines come out at different times. Like, for example, I was thinking about therapy and Charles, I think, was rightly calling out that a lot of it really boomed in the 60s. But therapy came way before, uh, you know, like Freud was the start of the 20th century or whatever. Um, and then also a little bit what Karen was saying, that the Internet is basically at the end. Um, you know, there was no Internet. Oh, wait a minute, I think I've... Is, is it gone? Paul? I don't hear Paul anymore. Okay, well, go ahead, Heidi, and we'll see if he comes back. Uh, yeah, I wanted also to, to mention that uh, every stage of development seems to have a uh, a different economic system, uh, which is uh, Said Dalabani, no, in memonomics. Um, how how was this book book called? That's it. Memonomics. Memonomics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I had another idea, but now I I, I lost it. But um, what is also um, developing in in along with this ah you you mentioned the um, the i think paul mentioned the, that there was green uh, development already before we had uh, in in especially in germany the romanticists in, in 1800 something you know uh, in music and in poetry and in literature that was already uh, Green ideas in many, maybe not ideas, but expression of the of the sensitivity, which actually came into a mass <laughs> uh, movement only hundred years uh, and so later. So I do think that um, these developmental stages, yeah, we say they started there and there, but maybe they didn't. Maybe they they started long before, but only we see them. Uh, expressing in culture only at, from a certain time on. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, often I read that uh, I think Wilbur says Jesus was green, or Marx was green, or things like that, and the rest of the population was not at all. And so they interpret the knowledge in a certain way from their perspective, and that that kind of makes sense to what we're discussing. Uh, another element I was thinking about is, is for me, is, especially when it comes to realizing that green is, is not functioning anymore for the level of complexity that we're dealing with, is this old uh, IDW uh, intellectual dark web coming online, like in some ways. It's where it's coming from the right, but it's also coming from the left being kind of fed up with like not being able to look at some realities in deeper sense. Uh, I know um, I, I listened uh, to, uh, to Ken a bit talking about that. And I thought it was interesting because it's like, well, this is seemed to be, uh, uh, it's needed. Like I look online and it's people need that kind of intellectual uh, mongering or intellectual uh, deepening about um, all sorts of stuff because uh, it comes, a, we come to a place where we're not able to make sense of, of, uh, of, of the landscape. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's getting so um, all over the place and the culture war and, 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 and so on and so on. Um, so for me, it's, it's confronting uh, the, the blockage of, of a certain uh, state of, of, uh, I wouldn't say progress, but a certain state of where we are as a society um, uh, that, that leads us to, um, to develop this uh, 
uh, other perspective, like which is integral, is able to take more more point of views than than the, the other ones. Um, yeah, that's it. Great, thanks, Theo. Charles. Um, right. Okay. Um, returning to my case for. Uh, for green not being a stage of development that belongs on the same spectrum as as orange and teal and, and turquoise and uh, below the other uh, or rather above the others. Um, let me add this. Um, just offhand, green seems to me because of, of, of its instability and its lack of a coherent epistemology uh, and the um, and and the negative um, developments that have uh, resulted from it, um, the uh, political correctness, identity politics, uh, the nihilism, the relativism, and so on, uh, could we regard green as uh, just a really fucked up orange that's really alienated, really neurotic, uh, sort, of, sort of like the rebels of the 1960s who were uh, to a large measure revolting against their parents, Okay, so I leave that, I leave that question for a uh, possible debate. A uh, second point I wanna to return to uh, is, is a more general case. Many of the developments that Green is proud of and lays claim to uh, may in fact be embraced by Orange without Orange having to uh, transcend at all. And I would list, for example, environmentalism, uh, egalitarianism, uh, and uh, civil rights, feminism, and and um, and the and internet uh, and the internet. Why couldn't a person at Orange embrace all of those without giving up uh, any of the other core Orange values? I got I got something there uh, at least. Can I go? Yeah. Um, well, this this distinction between. Um, equal opportunity and equal outcome seems to be the main uh, differentiator from some of the points you touched, um, Charles. Um, and I, I, I somewhat agree, you know, like that Orange uh, is able to take environmentalism as, you know, it's just a business kind of orient, like it's good for business sort of thing, you know, or it makes sense and it's scientifically based and it's, and so I think environmentalists uh, that are going a bit too far. It's all about like, we just need to protect the environment and that's, that's all we need to do and stop doing what we're doing, you know, from the sense of like bad capitalism taking over the planet and destroying it. Uh, and there, there's some, there's some grounding in that as well. Like to some extent, uh, um, this argument is like, oh, the market is not able to self-regulate is really important at uh, green and even, I think, integral. Um, and there's a lot of debate on these things. It's like, I don't think everybody agrees on, on what is uh, uh, good manners of, of um, self-regulation. And then, you know, we talk about um, the dynamic of equilibrium in the system, which comes more at green, but then, you know, uh, from a more scientific perspective, you'll go into uh, even though, well, there's just, dynamic change. There's never been an equilibrium. There's never been, uh, um, so often I hear the comment from someone who's more at orange, say, well, this happened before. There was a, a phase in evolution at some point where, you know, uh, PPM of uh, carbon uh, CO2 um, in the atmosphere was way above what, what it is right now. So those are all kind of, um, point of views that are are just limited in their in their quadrants you know like I, I think that's the main distinction there is that maybe yeah, just to finish maybe green is 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 inclined toward more the interior and orange towards more the exterior and that's the, what we have yeah. hmm, good point Karen were you next in line uh, yeah, and I had three points and I'm trying to sort them out. I think, uh, Charles, to your point, what I would say to that is you can stay in orange and take on most of the trappings of green, but unless you give up the myth of the given, unless you see that 
this is a construct in here, you're going to stay in what Wilbur calls flatland. And that's a big topic, but I'll drop it there because I wanna go into lines. This whole debate we've been having for most of this conversation, I think where you, the lines, if we understand what Wilbur means by them, that would answer a lot of this because we're not just one monolithic uh, um, personality. We have lines, we have 10, 12, 15 different kinds of UAB, our emotional intelligence, our IQ, we have our physical, we have our moral standing, and you can be at different stages on each line. And so we can be, we're always part in, we're never all in one level, and it can shift the time. So we can have part uh, some of our lines being in orange or even lower, and some being in green, and maybe a couple being up in second tier. And I want to come back to the um, um, myth of the given, where we, because I want to make a, start to make a big point with that. The disintegration we feel at green when we give up the myth of the given, we say, everything I know is just a construct. That begins our ability to shift into second tier because as we go up into second and third tier, as I understand it, we realize more and more and more as a construct. And we get to the point eventually in third tier, and Ken Wilbur explicates this, where we see that the entire manifested universe is a projection of spirit. I mean, we t as we go up into second and third tier, we kind of take back more and more of myths of the given, and that process begins at green. And I don't think we can really go up into second tier until we've at least begun the process of letting go of the myth of the given and understanding. I mean, our egos are a construct. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Charles. Uh, Karen just made two great points. Let's don't forget the lines of development. Um, I think when we're discussing this uh, issue of whether green is, is the stage or, um, or, or um, a, a misbegotten offshoot of uh, modernity, um, we do have to keep lines of development in mind. But, but I think the one that we're mostly talking about is the cognitive uh, or a little more broadly, the worldview, and, and Karen is quite correct uh, to bring into play the myth of the given. And uh, Karen, if I'm not mistaken, the myth of the given would be an issue in the cognitive line of development or the worldview. W would you agree with that? Provisionally, I'll have to think about it, but for now, yes. Okay. Uh, now, a, st a, a standard scientific materialist at orange would probably grant you some of that uh, because we have a lot of scientific knowledge that that would uh, support the idea that reality is partly uh, constructed by our perceptual apparatus and um, culturally uh, by influences from the uh, from our social environment and so on uh, but probably wouldn't go as far as you would go um, so a question here is uh, taking the part of orange. Uh, hey, as an orange person, I, I can accept uh, uh, partially uh, that reality is constructed, but you green people go way overboard with that and uh, tend to uh, fall into the baby bathwater problem of thinking that uh, that is drinking the bathwater along with the baby, that the whole uh, of reality is constructed. And uh, that surely is nonsense. I think, <laughs> I just want to say something. I think um, the sense making at orange is often used. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to express this. It's like, Ah, it's, it's, sorry, I don't know, I don't know really what I'm trying to say, but this constructivist view uh, of the world, and I don't know if I'm using, even using the right, the right term here, but um, it, 
at, at Orange, maybe the scientific worldview and uh, more like car Cartesianism or things like like that, I think are, are thinking about um, sis, uh, system thinking, system thinking applied to everything, sort of, um, and not uh, not accepting the dimension of the interiority. Um, seems to be, um, so yeah, to me, it just seems to be limited in its ability to make sense. Uh, but he used that as a defense to say, well, if, if I'm not able to look at it, if I'm not able to uh, observe it with my senses, it doesn't exist. Uh, am, I, am I making sense with this? Is that like what orange seems to be representing? Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, when, when green comes online, it, it goes the other way saying, okay, everything is, is constructed, and when it goes too far, yeah. Uh, and that's where we see that there's, there's some pitfalls and then integral is, is necessary to kind of <laughs> re-put these things together. That's my, my point. <laughs> Let me, I just want to jump in here and, and say something to Charles. Um, uh, just g give you some concrete examples or something. Let's, let's try to frame this in a concrete way. Then, then we'll have you speak and then Karen will go. So my first thing, Charles, is have you spent a lot of time in environments that are like super orange, like corporate, like super corporate cutthroat, let's make money at the expense of everything else kind of environments? And just think about if you're in, such, in that kind of environment, how like – if you could just feel into it, just what does it feel like palpably? And then you go to a more green environment where they they care about things like social justice and organic food, uh, climate change, and maybe mindfulness and Eastern spirituality. There is a pretty, in my experience, a pretty definitive difference in just the density of the environment. I mean, the green people, as much as they drive us crazy, it is, in my in my opinion, still closer to teal than these. I've been, I've been working with lawyers lately to, for, with mediation and doing marketing for, to recruit lawyers to some of these events. And I can barely stomach it for more than an hour sending out emails and interacting with these guys. I mean, it's just that their orange, like corporate hierarchy cutthroat thing is so different from what I'm used to, you know, that I, I have to say just from that experience that green is a definitively a different stage and more on the way to integral than orange. Thank you. What's the rebuttal? Go ahead. I don't think you'll get a rebuttal. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in such environments, um, uh, but, I, but I have worked for uh, industry at various periods of my life, but uh, it wasn't my preference. So anytime I get back into education, I would do that. Uh, but the thing is, um, educational systems tend to be uh, dominator hierarchies as well. Not as vicious as, uh, as in industry, but uh, nevertheless, uh, one is never in much doubt as to who holds the power in these bureaucratic organizations, like universities and, and even district school systems. Um, I fought a few battles uh, along those lines on behalf of, of green values. So I kind of know that. And I sympathize with your uh, frustration, uh, Ryan, when in those more, uh, more competitive uh, dominated hierarchy type situations. Um, if I can uh, go back to just a, a couple of examples about uh, what I was talking about the myth of given a couple of minutes ago. Um, a scientist would be willing to admit, for example, that that color is not given to us, that there, there is no color in nature. Uh, natural things are made up of atoms and atoms have no color. So color is conferred by our uh, perceptual at apparatus. Um, essentially uh, parts of our brain and, and our optical system. Um, another example would be um, from, um, what's, what's the guy's name? Uh, Thomas Kuhn's work. Thomas Kuhn uh, showed that um, scientific theories uh, are actually paradigms. That is, they're injunctions to uh, carry on a certain line of investigation and uh, consider it as valid until um, you know, anomalies uh, develop when doing normal science and then a revolution is called for. So 
uh, if you buy Kuhn's analysis of the historicity of science, you realize that science uh, theories are not read off of the book of nature. They are constructed. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're becoming more proficient on that all the time. Keep up the good work. Charles, could, could you just finish, summarize the, the last thing you were saying about Kuhn? Yeah, uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote, wrote a famous book called The Structure of, of uh, Scientific uh, Investigation, I guess, in, in which he showed that uh, science does not progress incrementally, step by step, uh, this, this guy contributes this little piece and then the next uh, scientist takes that one and adds a little bit to it. No, he showed that scientists, uh, science progresses by revolutions, that is by complete overthrowing of paradigms. For example, Newtonian uh, physics was shown to be false by relativity theory. Now that doesn't mean it's still not you know, useful, it is. It helped us put men on the moon after all. But uh, the idea, uh, once, once people realized that, that Kuhn was right to a large extent, then they had to admit that scientific theories are not discovered, they're constructed. And uh, they remain in, in a state of suspension until experimental evidence is uh, produced to justify them as theories. And then the whole process starts all over again. And then with the, with the new theory, normal science is carried on until uh, facts are discovered that it cannot explain and then uh, a crisis develops and, and another paradigm threatens to overthrow the previous one. So string theory may be one of those, for example, but as yet there are no experiments uh, that have uh, surfaced uh, to, support, uh, to support the theory. So it remains a hypothesis, not a theory. So uh, a lot of philosophers have, have come to realize that science is not what Orne says it is, namely an objective reading of the structure of nature and incorporated into books which will be valid in hundreds of years. No, no, uh, scientific theories are constructions and they are vulnerable to being overthrown at any given time. Great, thank you, Charles. So two examples there of, um, uh, of items that support the myth of the given theory. Right, I think Karen wants to say something, then we'll go to Theo. Yeah, first, validating uh, academia as orange. My experience of academia in graduate school was brutally orange, which was among the three reasons why I was delighted to bail out of academia. Um, but onto the myth of the given and constructs. One of the things, among the many things that knocked my socks off at uh, Ken Wilber's What Now conference in Denver, uh, what, 16 months ago, um, they had a neuroscientist present uh, results of some of the latest neuroscience with all the ways they can scan brains now and see what's happening when. Um, when P, even when we see something, just the light impinging on our retina and the optic nerve traveling, and then it's processed at the back of the head in the optic center, there's a few millionths of a second delay between the light striking the retina and us actually seeing, because what we see is constructed by our optic center. The input from the optic nerve is only 20% of what's happening in our brain to construct the visual image that we see just looking around. The other 80% come from other brain centers like memory, emotion, and there were a couple of others I don't remember. Even what we see when we look out there is a construct of our brain. And I will just, you know, so letting go of the myth of the given, I think, is an essential part of what we do while we proceed through green that enables us to jump up into second tier. And I will end by just a little comment. I'm not sure we want to do this today, but I had an experience after I'd been meditating for a number of years um, when I actually saw for a moment the level at which we collectively in our consciousness construct all of manifested reality. That was an experience I had. And so I'll just toss that out there and we can take it up another time because it's kind of a big subject. Yeah, thanks guys. I think uh, from, from one thing I've been thinking about, especially about science discovery or innovation uh, per se, in terms of uh, making more room for um, consciousness, consciousness making more room for reality, for an understanding of reality. Um, I was just having this idea as like literally this, this tendency that we've seen in the past as well, like not just today, but where 
someone at the edge of, of, of consciousness is trying to push their new ideas to others, say, hey, look at my discovery here. This is completely different than what we thought it was, you know? And uh, that's kind of what we're doing all the time, especially, you know, uh, when we're going on the edge of, of consciousness is we're trying to tell people, hey, come here with me. Like I have this other perspective that is making more sense than what I think we have here. Um, uh, Galileo or things like that, you know? And I think at Integral, it, we come at, to have the ability to know this, to understand that, this is a, like, this is the new given. This is a new kind of reality we're dealing with is that, hey, we're always gonna make more room for stuff that we haven't discovered yet, you know? And as a society, eventually I hope we get to this point, it's like, like that's how it works. It's like, we know like our, our wisdom is at that level. It's like, we know that's how it works. So let's say in a society where it's integral, okay? Mostly the, the mainstream of, of, of philosophy, the mainstream of, uh, of uh, orientation is, is gone to up to integral and then all kinds of new discoveries will be possible because of that because people will have that inner ability this uh capacity to understand that dynamic in itself and maybe we'll be able to you know uh design education system and design our, our organizations uh innovation uh faculties to do that uh i mean to to um encourage that capacity um and that would be just awesome <laughs> Go ahead, Heidi. I suspect also that the, the further we develop, we will become more able to let go. And that might be with the help of spiritual practice, I don't know. But that we don't need to, to stick to beliefs anymore. Even if we have discovered this, it works like this, you know, and we are very sure of, of that. And then after a while we discover, oh, there's something else. And then the human tendency is to say, oh no, we, we stick with what we have found and I'm so proud I found that, you know, and uh, better don't, don't see what is coming up. So with uh, more development, we might be able to, even if it was a big achievement which we had, to let it go and open space for something new. If we have the new achievement or somebody else has the new achievement. And I think this is, that would be a, a huge step in human development if we can do that. And I'm not sure if this is already in second tier or if that's part of third tier that we can really collaborate in that sense that we don't need to have the success and hold on to our own success anymore or findings or whatever you want to, but that we can sort of share it or allow the other to develop our things further and we can step back into the second line. Something like that. I'm not sure, just throwing it out. Yeah, I'd just like to add something to this. It resonates to me as well in, in the, how it comes to, we come to a place where it doesn't matter who owns, there's no, like, there's no individual ownership of innovation or perspective or like different understanding. It, it's kind of a part of this where consciousness rising into its n new form. Um, and, and then, so we just accept that uh, we're part of that dynamic we're, we are, we are that dynamic and it's a totally different orientation that, than what we have in the, you know, in a competitive market or we have even at green, um, uh, the individualistic perspective is kind of like doesn't like it it doesn't need to take as much um ground yeah and i want to add that in what you say it's also that we are sort of a, a vessel and the the collective uh, knowledge comes through me or through you you might find it in another way as i do and for me the copyright thing sooner or later is completely obsolete because that it happens that you found it can be because you were very, very busy, you know? And, and I think still people who work it out in some way should be protected that not somebody else takes it away and says, that's mine. But the intellectual, um, the intellectual copyright, I think we have to, 
to abandon it because we we just got that from the universe you know and we are the 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 means the, the how do you say the radio station the 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 receiver of 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 things which are in the collective unconscious let's say that's at least what i i think so go ahead karen I, as I was listening to Theo and Heidi, I was hearing that old Beatles song, we did have the best music, come on. Um, Can't you see you're really only very small and life flows on within you and without you. And I love what you've brought up. That's going to be part of how I cognize second tier going forward is that it doesn't matter which one of the team made the home run. The win is the teams. And we can be very fluid in who steps into the lead at every moment and who steps back. And then I I add another part to it, which is that I'm thinking now maybe in second tier, we will understand from the get-go as part of the deep structure that wherever we are now is not the end point. There is always going to be more, that we do not have any final truths or total understandings, that if we've got Newtonian physics, somehow, somewhere, a next stage will come along that that transcends but includes whatever was good and true in us, that, there, that, that just knowing that there are the next stages beyond us is part of second tier. So that's that's really something to look forward to, all of this and just the, the fluidity and letting, and, and that's part of the letting go of the ego too. And, and that's part of the we space, what Heidi and Theo were just talking about. This is beautiful. I'm excited. Yeah, what, what I'm just want to, to ask if this is already second tier of, or if this will be third tier, because we are sort of entering second tier. I believe we who we are here and I'm, I'm for me myself. I'm not sure if I have this capacity yet. You know, so I, I envision that maybe that is even a step further, that we can really collaborate in this selfless way without, you know, without this false selflessness, but in a really open, um, open offering of of what we are able to do and contribute. I don't know if it is second tier or third. Well, I, I just want to jump in and say it's already 11.19, so we'll start doing um, closing statements, two minutes, and if people can share um, what was clarified for you, and also more questions that you may have about, about the topic today, if we need a stage of development. And just to um, jump on what Heidi was just saying, this is, uh, for my closing statement, um, my understanding is this, what you're talking about is actually a, a second tier phenomena that will come, start to come online more as we head into teal. And I'm actually reading a book on this right now. And it's all about how society is moving into a decentralized network where things are going to be almost free and people will share them and, and we will do away with patent laws and, and copyright laws to go for a more open sourced collaborative network um, in, which, in which information will be freely shared between people and, and companies will be properly incentivized. And to tie that in back into the discussion, that's another reason why I do think green is a stage of development because of emphasis on uh, collaboration and, and community um, and, and that taking precedence over solely material gain in a very capitalist dominator hierarchy kind of a uh, situation, right? That, that opens the door to what Heidi is talking about. With, with more, um, with this kind of, he, he, uh, Jeremy Rifkin calls it the internet of things in which humanity will make up a kind of neural network using the internet in which all of our energy and information will be freely shared. So yeah, I think uh, that's, and thank you everyone again for your participation and um, yeah, great discussion. I still will uh, answer to you, uh, Ryan. I think what you are saying is right. This is still, but from more from the outside, I'm talking about the psychological development and I don't oh. think we are there yet for, for quite a while. We might already do till practices, but until we as humans have reached that, this envy, the, the lack of envy and all these things, I think that will take some time. We try to, you know, we do the practice, but if it's really embodied and completely part of us, I think that takes more. Could yeah, you? I like the, for my checkout, I, I, there was a time when I was not so much enjoying the, the just theoretical talk, you know, 
then when the the examples ca came in i i it's not so much liking i i realized that i get tired you know i get oh my eyes begin to fall in so for me it's nice also to do that but i'm more ignited when we come into examples <laughs> and so uh yeah i would love if we could in the future what we are talking about, maybe first give an example or put that inside of an example so that it is more alive and it's not just theory. That's my take on it. Go ahead, Charles. A closing statement. Uh, what I've gotten from this terrific discussion is a, a reminder about the many factors that uh, we have to take into consideration when we're thinking about green, evaluating it, deciding whether it's a stage or, or a, a, a freak offspring of orange, uh, you know, whatever we decide in the end. Um, and uh, I'm quite grateful to all of you for that. Um, and how to bring the myth of the given into the, uh, into the mix as well. Uh, the trouble the green has for all of these items because we've been making claims well, certainly I've been making a bunch of claims about green throughout this discussion that I regard as true. And, and green just says, I'm sorry, what you think is true doesn't exist anymore. You know, we've shown that uh, it's all context, it's aperspectival, it can be deconstructed forever. So um, it would really be hard to get a diet in the wool green thinker into a discussion like this, but because he'd be constantly undercutting and deconstructing and poo-pooing. So uh, here's what the question that I want to leave everybody with. Uh, according to Ken and, and other thinkers, green is the leading edge of culture today. But how can such an unstable set of ideas, which, which is now uh, involved in uh, uh, a number of culture wars, which are uh, destabilizing societies in, in various ways, uh, how can it be regarded as the cutting edge? Or are we witnessing the disintegration of what used to be the cutting edge and uh, whose, uh, whose demise is being signaled by the rise of uh, right wing, of not only the culture wars, but right wing uh, governments and fascist movements around the world? In other words, what, what's happened to the so-called cutting edge and what's going to be the cutting edge that takes its place if it fails? That's an open question. Thank you very much, people. This has been terrific. Okay, well, Charles, that last statement of yours would make a terrific subject for another Zoom chat. Um, I, I am now, as a result of this, a number of things, this today, a number of things. First of all, I see green as the disintegration of the entire first tier, and that was part of its job. Um, I have a lot. I, I could say a lot more about that, but I won't because I want to wrap up what this conversation has done for me. And thank you, Charles, for testing this. I am more convinced that ever the green is a separate stage. And I have honed in on the concept of, of letting go of the myth of the given is one of the critical things that has, has to happen in the course of green to prepare us for second tier. And I now have a, a hypothesis about second tier that what we what Theo and Heidi were, were talking about back and forth just a few minutes ago, that letting go of the, the harshest part of the ego for the we space that allows the whole team to make the win and not not saying, oh, I made the home run, I'm the hero. Letting go of that, being open, more open to things, and um, then what I, I've even forgotten the point I made. Um, but I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing second tier in a different way now more clearly. It's, it's all a hypothesis, it's all just a mental map, but it's getting clearer and more orienting and more something I can use in my daily life. Thank you all. I'll, I'll uh, make my comment. Um... Yeah, th thanks for the discussion today. Uh, I like I like talking about green, uh, but I also like I need to go into a more integral perspective. Otherwise, I feel like kind of lost. So I'm glad we we did a bit of both. Um, um, one thing that I take from this is um, how you know a green has been a dominant structure in my life personally, and it's been quite difficult at a time to deal with it 
in so many respect and still today uh, and also uh, orange to some uh, to some respect because I studied in management and so it's really orange in, in that space but also studied sustainable development it's really green and orange um, what I'm trying to say yeah is is this ability to let go this ability to let go of the resistance the, the let go of uh, unfairness um, I think this is this is what you're talking about, uh, Charles, like the, the leading edge is like, we want fairness, but then ability to let go of it <laughs> as this is just like another construct. It's not like, it's not fully, um, how would I put it? It's not all there is, um, you know, this idea of, of equal, equ equality and outcome, like it doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not sense making. That's not uh, where it, it it actually resides uh, anymore, or it, it never really did. Uh, but it needed to take its charge, and then, like you're saying, um, Karen, it, it, its purpose was to make it fall apart, sort of like so we can jump on to the next next level, something like that. So thank you guys for the discussion today. Um. I kind of, I think I appreciate the call with like, I can feel it like intellectually and emotionally. Like I find talking about green and separating the good and the bad um, uh, really useful. And I often feel quite embodied after, like I sort of think a little bit this week about dealing with therapy and emotions and stuff. And there's part of me like, excuse my language, but part of me like really fucking hates some of the bad stuff of green. Like I think personally, I've kind of been burned um quite a lot by it um especially around kind of red and green and sort of having this integral mindset and stuff so to have some of the, the really good qualities of green clarified i find um i guess it makes me it makes it easier to navigate um but there's more of a dividing line between good and bad so the bad's more easily thrown off and the good is uh more easily embraced and um, I was thinking about your question, Charles, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I see the current culture as like on the, the ass end of green. And I see like a lot of solutions that need to happen seem to be around the integral kind of space. Um, so I'm not sure when that will come, but I think the, the more complex culture will probably be an integral one. I think green's kind of slowly starting to see its day. And... Um, yeah, I was a little bit with Theo as well, like kind of appreciating spinning it back to, to integral. Like I find if I talk about green too much, I almost end up in the kind of uh, really like upper left space, just feeling like really spaced out and kind of um, a little bit confused in uh, in Greenland. So um, yeah, I'm kind of enjoying, it seems like we, we've talked quite a fair bit about green the last few crossfires. I'm kind of enjoying like little baby steps to to more clarity and embodiment and uh, all this kind of stuff. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for sharing. And one, one more thing I'll share at the end here is when Heidi, you had mentioned you get really excited about like examples and stuff and specific things. And I was thinking it would be cool for one of these calls, maybe, maybe a Sunday call, maybe a crossfire call where we all came together and shared some of the practical work we're doing uh, using integral in the world and or or if we're not doing anything right now you know some of our goals and dreams with how we want to manifest integral consciousness and, and help move this fragmented green leading edge to a teal integral leading edge that will be filled with practical examples and brainstorming ideas of how Karen's favorite word I think it's force multipliers how we can be force multipliers for each other um, so maybe we can have a brainstorm or just a sharing about that so I will uh be in touch with all of you soon and have a wonderful day and uh, aloha. Aloha. Bye bye. Bye bye. On Sunday, and I plan hey, to propose the lower right quadrant and me. What has it to do with me and uh, the relationship? Which I, because I want to do that because the next few weeks I won't be there and I have a bad relationship to the lower right. So I want your help. <laughs> Hopefully we can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye for tonight. Take care. I will post that, and if somebody does the timestamps, would be nice. 
when you re-listen uh, it, maybe we should write that when people re-listen it, if they can do that time steps. Okay. Bye-bye.